Hello, this is our video for Europe. After a brief review of European music principles, we explore some traditional music styles from Greece, Spain, Russia, Scotland, Ireland, Hungary, and Bulgaria in this chapter. Relative to other major continents, only Australia is smaller geographically than Europe. When someone mentions Europe or European culture, most people in the United States assume the discussion focuses on Western Europe, that is, those countries west of and including Italy, Austria, and Germany. The northern countries of Norway, Sweden, and Finland are often included as well. Eastern and Southeastern Europe make up the remaining countries considered geographically a part of Europe and are often referred to as Eastern Europe to distinguish from Central and Western Europe. Europe, at least economically, includes 27 European countries. One means of delineating the specific European cultural backgrounds is based on language. The English speak English, Germans speak German, etc. Language is often important to regional cultural differences as well, as it tends to be in many cultures. Germans, for example, can generally tell very quickly from what area of the country someone is, based on their pronunciation. The Rom, or Gypsy people, and Jewish people are other important ethnic populations that do not have a European nation that they call home, but nevertheless figure as significant minorities throughout most European countries. The music of the world is frequently categorized as being either folk, classical, or popular. Popular music in the modern sense is strongly associated with the music business and media dissemination. Classical and folk music, together sometimes referred to as traditional music, can be categorized based on historical class associations, that is, classical music being of the aristocracy, folk music being music of the common people. Such associations are not generally valid in the modern age, as both classical and folk music traditions have patrons of all classes. Pedagogy, that is the learning of music, is often a means of delineating these categories today, classical music being studied in a formal manner, while folk traditions are learned informally. The term classical applies to many traditions global globally, but in the European context, the reference is to art music. In this course, we are not getting into European classical art music, since it is usually covered in courses focusing specifically on that tradition. Art music development in the secular realm depends largely on the courts supporting artists and composers. Folk traditions in Spain, as well as many countries in southeastern Europe, have a unique blending of European and Arabic or Turkish cultural traits. This is due to the spread of the early Islamic Empire and the Ottoman Empire. One can easily hear musical traits from both cultural spheres in many prominent traditions from these regions, for instance, flamenco. The earliest polyphonic music in the art music realm typically dates to the 11th to 13th centuries. Harmony is a specific type of polyphony utilized by Europeans. If, for example, two vocalists are singing, they will sing in parts, on different pitches, which depending on the parts can be either melody and drone, or polyphony. The introduction of harmony requires a third part to establish a major or minor key. In vocal music, this requires at least three performers, Thus, an ensemble is necessary. As the harmonies become more complex, larger ensembles are required. In the case of instruments, European instruments are often created with the specific intent of playing polyphony and harmony. The piano is one good example of this, but others commonly perform with harmony, for instance, the Irish bagpipes. Other instruments are expected to be played in ensemble that creates harmony such as a string quartet. Rhythm tends to be very predictable in European music. 
This is a consequence of the European emphasis on harmony. In order for the pitches to blend correctly, they must sound at the same time. A complex rhythm makes it more difficult to create such harmonies. Thus, European music often has a steady meter to help organize the blending of pitches. Rhythm is therefore generally considered subordinate to harmony and melody in European music, whether it is classical or traditional. Our first site in Europe introduces one of the world's most archaic living traditions, Byzantine chant. Greek classical culture centered on Athens and is considered a foundation for all European culture. Some of the Western world's greatest philosophers, such as Plato and Aristotle, hail from Greek civilization. Alexander the Great is one of the most important political and military figures of this period. His empire spread from Macedonia through most of Western Asia, as well as Egypt, conquering the Persian Empire and ushering the Hellenistic period. His legacy remained a model for future conquerors, the Romans in particular. Beginning in the 13th century, the Ottomans began to conquer peoples throughout Western Asia and eventually into Southeastern Europe. By the 15th century, they conquered Constantinople and claimed dominion over much of what is today known as the Balkans. While the Greek population declared and won independence in the 1820s, they continually struggled against the Ottomans to expand their domain. Turkish Arabic influence in the region is quite pronounced in many aspects of culture. Greece attained its modern national borders in 1947. Its strategic location was important to both the Nazis and Allied forces during World War II. The modern state has struggled at times from economic and political uncertainty, but the country continues to be a popular tourist destination with its numerous beaches and historical landmarks. Let's listen to this Byzantine chant. Your first impressions will be of an ethereal chant over a drone. The basic musical elements are melodic chant over a continuous drone. Byzantine chant is often associated with monastic traditions. Therefore, male choirs are most common. In many Orthodox churches, much of the liturgy is chanted rather than merely spoken. This is believed to give the words more efficacy and distinguish the recitation from everyday speech. Such chants use modes, known as echoi, that do not adhere to the major minor system associated with modern European music. Cultural considerations. The Greek Orthodox Church was once centered in Byzantium, later known as Constantinople, and then Istanbul. The Byzantine or Eastern Church was at one time unified 
with the Western Roman Catholic Church, but split in 1054 for theological and primarily political reasons. Eastern Orthodox churches have strongly solidified ritual practices and are considered quite sensual by outsiders with much colorful iconography, incense, and vocal music. Instrumental performances are uncommon in the Orthodox traditions. The monastic Republic of Athos is of particular interest. The chants of this monastic tradition are considered to be among the oldest in the Christian church, Western or Eastern, dating to as early as the 5th century. This ancient chant is considered to have been influenced by pre-Christian traditions, for example, Greek modes, as well as Jewish liturgical chant. Since this music is unique and very old, there is very little connection to Western traditions. Our next site, Flamenco, also reveals considerable non-European influence. The southernmost region of Spain, Andalusia, is most affected by the cultural traditions of the Arabic world. It was the last stronghold of the Moors, or Muslims, who were ousted from the region in 1492. Interestingly, the same year that Columbus was sent on his voyage to the New World. Since then, Spain has been predominantly Roman Catholic. On Columbus's heels came the Spanish conquistadors, who were accompanied by numerous Roman Catholic missionaries. As a result, much of the Western Hemisphere has strong cultural connections with Spain. For much of its modern history, Spain has been politically and economically isolated from the West, rest of Western Europe. As such, visitors to the region are often struck by the old world feel of its culture, where one can still spot the occasional sojourner traveling via donkey or attend a bullfight. Communities of the Rome people, Gitano in Spanish, are found throughout many areas, especially in Andalusia. Let's listen to this flamenco example. Your first impressions will be of passionate vocals with vibrant guitar. There are enthusiastic onlookers and energetic dancers in the background.
Chiquillo. 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 Chiquillo.
Our Russian musical encounter introduces the balalaika and its music heritage. More than 6.5 million square miles, Russia is the world's largest country. Russia's colorful history focuses mainly on the great Tsars, or kings of the past, Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and Nicholas the Bloody are among the most notable. The latter abdicated in 1917 as a result of the Russian Revolution, which initiated the communist period that lasted until 1991. The result of this revolution was the formation of the Soviet Union, which was established in 1922. The Soviet Union became one of the world's superpowers and was the major opponent to the United States and its allies during the Cold War, which followed World War II. During this period, many folk traditions were highlighted by the state and used as propaganda to promote po political ideology. Many classical musicians were encouraged to use folk music as inspiration for their compositions. As a result, Many Russians still have a distaste for folk music and consider the art music traditions as more accurate reflections of Russian music. Though our discussion focuses on Russia's most distinctive music instrument, the balalaika, much of Russia's folk music emphasizes vocals. The Russian Orthodox Church, similar to the Greek Orthodox Church, includes a prominent chant tradition. But unlike the archaic sound of the Greek chant, Russian chant has been harmonized by 19th century composers. Let's listen to a balalaika orchestra. Your first impressions will be of chattering lutes. Here we go. First impressions, a peppy tune, the chattering lutes, balalaikas, and plodding string bass stand out in this example. There is also accordion in the background. Balalaika comes from a verb that means to chatter. The balalaika is a fretted plucked lute with a triangular shaped body. The instrument is found in different sizes to produce different ranges. An accordion is also present. While balalaika's orchestras do not typically accompany dance, much of the music performed is arranged from folk dance tunes. The polka, in particular, is a dance common throughout Eastern Europe and the inspiration for many pieces associated for balalaika ensembles. The domra is a small plucked lute that precedes the development of the balalaika. The body of the domra is rounded during the 17th century, the Tsar of Russia banned all folk music in an attempt to squash public criticisms of his rule by the popular jesters who traveled from village to village, performing to earn a living. The balalaika was created to replace this instrument because its triangular body was quicker to construct than a rounded body. Although the ban on instruments was short-lived, the balalaika became a popular folk instrument as a result of this period. Vasily Andreev, a Russian noble, observed one of his workers playing the balalaika and decided to promote it as a unique Russian cultural artifact. Nicknamed the father of the balalaika, he encouraged the development of the balalaika as a classical instrument, though it never really achieved this status. His balalaika orchestras, however, became popular in Russia and elsewhere in Europe, as well as in the United States. Today, the balalaika is symbolic of Russian musical identity. Thus, 
wherever Russians reside, they often establish groups. At the end of this video, or actually in the description of the YouTube video, you will see a clip of the Los Angeles St. Petersburg Russian Folk Orchestra. Other connections include bands like the Red Elvises. The Red Elvises have been around since the 1990s when I first saw them perform on the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica. They are a rock band based in Los Angeles that incorporates Russian-themed songs and instruments. Their bass player normally plays a huge ba bass balalaika, like the one pictured. In Scotland, we'll be introduced to one of the two bagpipe traditions that we will study in this video, the Highland Pipes. Scotland is still considered part of the United Kingdom. Scotland had a vote to leave the UK in 2014, but the referendum failed. Today, the country is still reconsidering moving toward complete political independence from British rule. The western and northern areas of Scotland are quite mountainous, whereas the major urban areas, such as Glasgow and Edinburgh, are found in lowland areas. Scots often distinguish between highland and lowland culture. Highland culture is often cited as the source for Scotland's unique cultural identity. Scotland boasts some prominent tourist attractions, such as Loch Ness, alleged home of the Loch Ness Monster, or Nessie as, it's, as she's known, and the home of golf, St. Andrew's Golf Course. Let's listen to an example of the Highland Pipes. Our first impressions will be of a highly strident tone and a constant drone. Though the Highland Pipes are perhaps best known internationally, there are numerous bagpipes traditions found throughout the world. One thing all have in common is an airbag, drone pipes, and a melodic pipe called a chanter. The Highland Pipes have three drone pipes, two tenor drones, and a bass drone, tuned an octave and two octaves below the primary pitch of the chanter. Each drone pipe has a single reed while the chanter has a double reed, all sounding when pressure is applied to the airbag, forcing air through the pipes. The Highland pipes use a blow blowpipe to get air into the bag. Thus, it's lung-driven compared to the bellows-driven bagpipes that we are going to study in Ireland. Pibrog is a musical form common to Highland pipe performance, essentially a theme with variations kind of composition. This form is so common to Highland Pipes performances that they are sometimes known as Pibrogue Pipes. This piece is a medley of one 
theme along with two variations. Listen for the change from one piece to the next. Cultural Considerations and Connections The Highland Pipes are not only central to Scottish musical identity, but strongly connected to their cultural identity. From cartoon caricatures to international state affairs, the Scottish bagpiper in kilt is often used as an icon for Scotland. Though historically unproven, the Highland Pipes are believed to have been developed among Highlanders as a mean of intimidating the enemy and as a way to signal during battle. As such, these bagpipes have strongly become associated with the Scottish military. Snare and bass drums are often heard accompanying bagpipe ensembles. The Lone Piper is often found in context to make an announcement. They often precede wedding, wedding processions as well as funeral processions. In the past, the piper performed at daybreak to awaken everyone. Today, outside of Scotland, Highland bagpipers are commonly found anywhere the British Empire colonized. They are commonly seen in Canada and the United States in association with police and fire troops due to the predominance of Scottish and Irish descendants being members of these organizations in the past and today. They are also easily found in places like India, Australia, and South Africa. One of the most famous English language songs, Amazing Grace, is based on a Scottish bagpipe tune. In addition to their presence in American funerals and Scottish pride events, such as the Highland Games, the Highland Pipes can be heard on numerous soundtracks, of which the best known is probably the film Braveheart. Our next stop is Ireland. Ireland is sometimes called the Emerald Isle due to its lush green grasslands. Celtic-speaking peoples are believed to have begun arriving to the British Isles around the 6th century BC. Though Celtic culture is considered to have spread throughout much of Central and Western Europe, developing over many millennia, it is today most often associated with Ireland. Many Celts in Ireland and Wales had adopted Christianity by the late 7th century, and the familiar Celtic cross, with the circle encompassing the intersecting lines of the cross, date to roughly the 8th century. The Irish potato famine of the mid-19th century a period during which the Irish were forced to export most of their food to England, decimated much of Ireland's population. Up to one million people are believed to have died, and another two million emigrated to other countries as a result, many coming to the United States. Ireland is actually two countries, the Republic of Ireland, pictured in yellow, and Northern Ireland, pictured in green, which remains part of the UK. The former gained its independence from the British in 1922, having been a colony of the British since 1801. Northern Ireland remains largely Protestant. Let's listen to an example of Ilian bagpipes. Our first impressions will be that the Irish pipes are mellow relative to the strident timbre of the Scottish pipes. They have melody and drone, just as their Scot Scottish counterpart, but also chords, full harmony, that change during the performance. This is a medley of three pieces, an air, which begins in free tempo, free rhythm, and two reels that are in duple rhythm.
Ilian, meaning elbow, is the most common Irish term for this instrument, and is believed to reference the use of the elbow to pump the bellows that fills the airbag. The regulators are three pipes with keys that when pressed change the acoustic length of the pipes, thus regulating the airflow to produce different pitches. The keys are arranged in rows so that the musician can press various combinations to create different chords, that is, harmony. The use of bellows allows the musician to sing as well as play. The instrument does not produce a great volume of sound in comparison to the highland pipes. Thus, it is often found in ensembles comprised of various instruments, usually a fiddle, button box, or Irish accordion, tin whistle, and frame drum. Such ensembles typically play indoors for dance events. A common context for the performance of Irish pipes is in a pub or public house where beer and food are served. Such venues often have informal dancing areas and ad hoc musicians sometimes gather in sessions to play familiar tunes. Such groups are known as Cayley bands and consist of a variety of instruments, including the Irish Ilian pipes, as well as the boron, a frame drum, button boxes or accordions, fiddles, flutes, and sometimes spoons. The Chieftains is the best known Irish traditional band, now retired. I saw their farewell concert at Disney Hall on March 1st, 2000. Such bands, along with their Scottish counterparts, are often considered the source for Appalachian music traditions in the United States, such as old time music and bluegrass. A list of crossover Irish pop and rock acts is a long one. But notable mentions are U2, Van Morrison, Enya, The Cranberries, Sinead O'Connor, and Flagging, Flogging Molly. The theatrical show River Dance, featuring Irish music and dance, has been seen by 25 million people since the 1990s, making it one of the most successful dance productions ever. 1990s, making it one of the most successful dance productions ever. The hurdy-gurdy, known as the teclerant in Hungary, is also a common instrument in France. The Danube River Valley, a central geographic feature of Hungary, essentially bisecting the country, has been host to a number of invaders, both European and Asian, Hungary has been at the crossroads between the West and the East for centuries, being occupied by Asian invaders, namely the Mongols and the Ottoman Turks, as well as being dominated by European powers such as the Habsburgs, Nazis, and the Soviet Union. Between such influences have been the Hungarian kings who more or less successfully aligned themselves with Central European traditions so that Hungary has a unique blend of Western and Eastern European culture. The Rome, or Gypsy people, are a large minority in Hungary and have greatly influenced musical traditions throughout the country. Their style of performance here is much different than the communities examined earlier from Spain. Let's play this example of a hurdy-gurdy. A first-time listener will often mistake the hurdy-gurdy for a Scottish bagpipe due to its use of melody over a single-pitch drone and the similar timbre of the instruments. A key feature to listen for is the buzz timbre used to articulate the rhythm.
The hurdy-gurdy is a chordophone that uses a rosin or resin-covered wheel to set the strings in motion. The performer turns a crank with his right hand to spin the wheel and jerks it at different positions to create rhythmic accents. He can also engage a buzzing drone to give it a different timbre. Melody is produced by pressing keys, a series of wooden tangents that touch the melodic strings at various points to change the pitch. Many hurdy-gurdy pieces use a fluctuating tempo described as parlando rubato, or speech rhythm. This piece, as in the last two examples, has, is a collection of three different tunes. Cultural Considerations and Connections In the realm of music, two of the most famous Hungarians are Franz Liszt, the pianist and composer, and Bela Bartok, the composer. Bartok is particularly important for ethnomusicologists as he traveled throughout much of Southeastern Europe and Western Asia transcribing traditional musical performances. Such research is considered among the earliest of true ethnographic fieldwork in the realm of ethnomusicology. His research helped differentiate music established by the Romani and those styles that were true Hungarian folk songs. The Rome are widespread throughout Hungary, but have significant visibility in Budapest, Hungary's capital city, where they frequently perform as musicians. Hungary's national instrument, the cymbalon, pictured here, was bought, brought by Romani populations and is considered a descendant of the Iranian santur. The cymbalon, however, is more complex, using dampers operated by a foot pedal, similar to those on a piano and has a much wider range than the smaller Iranian santur. Though this instrument was common in folk contexts, classical composers sometimes wrote pieces for the cymbalon as well, and it remains a subject of study in the music conservatory of Budapest. The cymbalon probably inspired the invention of the piano. In addition to connections with Bartok, Western classical music, and the piano, the cymbalon was cleverly used by the original Mission Impossible film composer Lalo Schifrin on his piece Danube Incident, which in turn was sampled by the British group Portishead on their song Sour Times. Check out Schifrin's piece and then the Portishead song in, our, um, in the, the links in the uh, description for this YouTube video. The cymbalon is responsible for creating a wonderfully mysterious mood in these songs. You can find hurdy-gurdy played on some pop albums. There are also electronic hurdy-gurdies. More relevant to this course are the folk groups, such as Musicas, that have been touring the world since the 1970s. A folk group appeared in the quasi-documentary film La Chodrome, along with a neighboring Romani, Rom uh, Romanian Romani group, Tarak de Hajduk, who achieved worldwide popularity by appearing in the film. Look for these links in the description to this video. In our last stop, we'll visit Bulgaria. Choral traditions are particularly common in the folk music traditions of Eastern Europe, especially Russia and Bulgaria. Bulgaria, along with Greece, borders Turkey at the southern southeastern edge of Europe. As a result, Bulgarian culture has a prominent mix of European and Arabic Turkish characteristics. The region was dominated by the Ottoman Turks for more than 900 years. After World War II, they came under the influence of the Soviet Union, and the Bulgarian government promoted many folk traditions to meet its political agenda. Let's listen to a Bulgarian women's chorus. Our first impressions will be Bulgarian choral singing, singing frequently uses dissonant intervals, such as both major and minor seconds. These give the music an unsettling quality. Let's listen. <laughs>
moral analysis. All female choirs are common, an after effect of communist promotion of folk music traditions. Two major elements in this example include a drone, a bellowing, and the higher melody, crying out. Sudden glides and occasional shouts are common in Bulgarian choral singing. Non-metrical or complex metered performances are common. The ring like a bell reference refers to the use of close dissonant harmonies like the minor second. Sounds like a large ringing bell. Microtones influenced by the musical system of Makam from West Asia also contribute to the unique harmonies of Bulgarian performance. The Ottoman influence is heard in the lyrical content of many songs. Laments, in particular, often dwell on the challenges faced by Bulgarians as a result of the occupying invaders. Musically, the use of microtonal intervals sometimes occurs, as the Western tuning system does not correspond to those typical of Western Asia. Solo performances in the Arabic style using a strained vocal timbre and melismatic text setting are common. This is combined with the European emphasis on harmony to give Bulgarian performance a unique blend of both European and West Asian cultural traditions. Folk choirs became common during many communist states during the Cold War years, from roughly 1947 to 1991. As a result, peasant music was highlighted to promote political ideology, though the music was often updated to appeal to non-native audiences. Le Mystère de Bois Volgar, or Mysterious Voices of Bulgaria, a women's choir, in particular, gained international acclaim in the 1950s and has maintained significant popularity among world music enthusiasts since that time. Look for a link in the video description. There are seven links in the YouTube description to music discussed earlier in this video. It is well worth watching them all. I've also included several scenes from the 1990 film La Chodrome, the film I discussed featuring vignettes of Roma musicians in Europe. In the first link, an obviously well-off Hungarian mother and child wait at a train station. Across the tracks, a Roma family await a train as well. At that time, these groups were still segregated and had to travel on separate trains because they were not allowed to mix with pure Hungarians. The well-off mother is sad about something, so the kid does what Hungarians often do to cheer themselves up, hire Roma musicians. The child only has a few pennies, but the group plays for them regardless. Tell me if you can't help smiling during this scene. Yes, it's staged, but very joyful. In the next clip, the Roma Romanian Romani group, Taraf de Haiduc, performs a lively dance tune. They traveled the world for years after this film came out, and I was lucky to see them when I was a student at UCLA. Finally, a clip of an intense flamenco performance from the same film. I may assign that you watch the entire film. We'll see how the semester goes. Thank you for watching.